welcome back to everybody. As I've met most of you in the room at this point, my name's Kate Bonansinga, and I'm the director of the School of Art here in the College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning at University of Cincinnati. And before I introduce our distinguished presenter, Donald Lipsky, I want to express gratitude for, to a, a few people. So I, just a reminder, over the past couple of days, I've met artists who currently reside all over the place, from Florida to Kentucky to Alabama, Arkansas, Texas, Georgia, Tennessee, and of course, Ohio. So I just want to congratulate MSA on having such a wide reach. It's been a real pleasure to, sh to share our campus with all of you. And so you as a group are the first people I want to thank for coming here and enriching our community with your art and yourselves. But I also want to thank those who have been involved for more than two years with the planning and execution of this conference. From the University of Cincinnati, we have co a conference committee that has worked tirelessly and they are professors Marin Agarwal, Matt Lynch, Edward Sanchez, graduate student Adrian Dixon, and director of galleries and our museum studies director, Aaron Cowan. Also the MSA conference committee, which was comprised of MSA board president, Jason Brown, and board members, Isaac Duncan III, Kristen Tordella Williams, Brett Price, who was also responsible for connecting UC to MSA in the first place, and MSA Managing Director Bags McKelvey. Also thanks to the many student volunteers and to the MSA board members for your support and hard work to make all of this come together. And as I mentioned, for bringing your art and yourselves to Cincinnati. Dan Dugan and Aaron Rucker figured out all the complex technology required to execute this hybrid meeting. And it looks like I'm live up there now with Donald next to me. And then of course, Emily Pialucci and Katie Pataco were tireless in their commitment to every planning and administrative detail. Thank you so much forever and always for that. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce artist Donald Lipsky. Coincidentally, he, like our guest speaker earlier today, Jean Shin, earned the Scholastic Art Award in high school. He then went on to earn an MFA in ceramics from the Cranbrook Academy of Art in 1973, where he was honored as distinguished alumnus in 2013. Lipsky taught at the University of Oklahoma from 1973 to 1977, when he moved to New York City, where he continues to reside. Lipsky soon gained recognition with his 1978 installation, Gathering Dust, comprised of thousands of tiny sculptures pinned to the wall. His installation work gained further traction in the 1990s with the bells at the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center. Lipsky has earned three National Endowment for the Arts grants, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Rome Prize of the American Academy in Rome, amongst other honors. His work is in permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, and the Art Institute of Chicago, amongst other museums. In recent years, Lipsky has focused his efforts on creating large-scale works for public spaces. Please help me to welcome Donald Lipsky. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, our summer cottage is out near the beach in Long Island, and my studio is uh, this disaster relief tent. And just as this meeting started, somewhere down the street, a uh, leaf blower, I think it is, started up. So we'll see how that goes. I hope you can all hear me fine. As was mentioned, uh, these are uh, the little sculptures I've been making all my life. And when I was at Cranbrook, which is 50 years ago, uh, I started saving these. And uh, eventually I had lots and lots of them. And 
uh, I started pinning them to the wall. And this became uh, my show, Gathering Dust at MoMA uh, I, in 1979. <clears throat> and this man uh, on the right, Carl Salway, uh, became aware of the show and uh, invited me to Cincinnati. And we became really, really good friends. He was a very uh, special dealer. Uh, the man on the left is his son, Michael, who is running the gallery now. Uh, Carl uh, passed away this last year. Um, Carl was an unusual dealer. Uh, he was the dealer of uh, Yoko Ono uh, and of John Cage and of uh, um, uh, Nam June Pike. I'm having a little trouble with my concentration because of this leaf blower in my ear that is really distracting me, but I'll do my best. So any attention from Carl was really uh, exciting. Uh, he was the dealer of Buckminster Fuller. You can see he was, he was attracted to an odd assortment of people. So he did a lot of prints with uh, Bucky. Um, and this is a, a Bucky Fuller little uh, rowing vehicle uh, at Carl's summer home uh, down in Kentucky, uh, where I spent many, many uh, wonderful uh, vacations with Carl and his family. There's a little installation of gathering dust at the Dayton Art Museum, which was the first museum that ever owned my work. And Carl uh, was responsible for that. So in the, in the years after that, I uh, just started making other sculptures uh, and artworks and I'm, these, what I'm showing you are not necessarily in any chronological order, and that'll be true for everything I show you today. Um, some of these uh, sculptures that I made over the next years, I would show just how, as I had shown gathering dust, just spread out and, uh, and uh, attached to the walls. And over time, they started to space out more and be more discrete individual objects. Uh, at, at times, I would get an idea in my mind and follow it quite uh, far down the road. Like um, I thought to use candles for a while. You know, candles are both uh, there for romance and they're celebratory and they're for mourning and they consume themselves. And I love the idea of candles. Uh, at one point I was in a scrapyard in New Jersey and I found this object in these little fittings uh, and looking into it, it led me to discover a product that Corning makes called acid waistline tubing. Uh, that I used for a number of artworks uh, that I called water lilies. I worked with a scientist to figure out preservative solutions so that I could make things that would last. Um, the, uh, this piece came to the attention of uh, Corning, the Corning Glass Company. I had used their um, what they called, I think they were 500, uh, 500 liter boiling, 500, I forget what they are. They're giant boiling flasks. Uh, and they were building a new headquarters and asked if maybe I could make them something like this. So I decided to take that and mount it on the back of a truck that I saw the next day uh, for sale on the street. Um, and they loved that and that's what, that's what we did. It's uh, now filled with yucca plants 
and it's at the Corning headquarters in Corning, New York. Uh, I've done a lot of work with glass over the years. It was really a, uh, an attractive medium to me. And it led me to uh, being an artist in residence at, uh, at Pilchuck and at the Experimental Glass Workshop in Tacoma. And I, I worked with uh, Chenna Dezig uh, in um, Murano and at Wheaton Arts in New Jersey. If someone invites me to work with glass, I am so there. Um, when I was at um, Wheaton Arts in New Jersey, there was an old guy there who had made Art Deco glass. And I loved the idea of having him make these perfect little vessels and then me screwing them up by poking some object into them. I made this at Pilchuck. Uh, it's a blown glass thing with some uh, ball bearings in it. So you can spin them around and I'm gonna indulge myself and let this video run for about a minute. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, well, along the way, I, I made some, uh, some larger artworks. There was a program called Art on the Beach uh, in the landfill created building the World Trade Center. And I made this staircase uh, that seemingly was pointed right up to the top of the World Trade Center. Uh, this was an installation of uh, little packets of dice and game pieces. Uh, this was a, a Cap Street project in San Francisco, and it was made from razor blades just cut right into the sheetrock. Uh, as an artist who hangs stuff on the wall, I'm always a little, uh, it's, it's, it's something to consider how you're going to hang something on the wall. Uh, but this was a perfect solution. They just hang themselves. So they're in uh, patterns like isobars and magnetic fields, 20,000 razor blades. Uh, this was at the Parish Art Museum. There had been a, uh, a forest fire in West Hampton uh, out on Long Island, New York. And I took two trees from that and put them together so that they shared a root ball. And I borrowed some machines from the chemical processing industry that all were apparently pumping uh, liquids into the root ball uh, in order to sort of keep it alive. Uh, this was at Vanos Castle in, uh, in Sweden, where I went through the sheds and the barns and uh, took things and made them into uh, wall sconces. And then the room was filled with cobblestones that spilled out the window into the courtyards. And this is made of shovels. Uh, this is a ball of rope. Um, uh, this is an ocean mooring buoy with a dice attached to it. So these things uh, got bigger and bigger, and this was all on the way to becoming a, uh, an artist involved in making um, art for public spaces. That uh, piece with the coins that was at the White House is now 
uh, at the University of Austin. And this is what came out of that. Uh, I made a big pile of mooring buoy buoys at the Walker Art Center. Um, it was supposed to be up for a year. And about five years later, they called me and said they were through with it. They'd like to send it back to me. Where should they send it? Well, these things are, uh, there are 55 buoys. They're five feet in diameter. Each weighs 650 pounds. You can fit six of them into a tractor trailer. Uh, after some scraping around, uh, they ended up at the Lawmire Sculpture Garden in St. Louis, where I put them together uh, with bolts into uh, a, like a string of pearls uh, about a hundred yards long. So I'm going to, all of these larger pieces and installations really led me into uh, the idea of making public art. And I've now made a lot of public art. In fact, I can, I'm just thinking, looking at the map, uh, I have to uh, add Honolulu uh, because a uh, piece just went up last week. Um, but before I show you that, I wanna tell you a story that leads me back to Cincinnati. Uh, the older members here uh, know uh, this man, Robert Maplethorpe, but some of you younger ones might not. Uh, he was a, a wonderful photographer uh, who died of AIDS in 1989, just as a show of his was traveling around the country. Um, well, that show got to, uh, some of the things in that show were a little bit racy and some racier than this piece I'm showing you here. Um, and there was uh, some people in Congress, notably Jesse Helms, who was a real right-wing curmudgeon uh, who called Maplethorpe a known homosexual and was up in arms that some NEA funds had gone to uh, fund this show. Uh, he was just raising holy hell. Um, and the show was supposed to go to the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, DC. Well, the director of the Corcoran, a woman named Christina Orr Cajal, uh, decided not to do the show that uh, she would just not do it. Um, and of course, all hell broke loose. Uh, the show was uh, called The Perfect Moment, so hence this sign. Uh, and there were demonstrations in Washington and uh, really ac across the country about this. Well, this man, uh, Buzz Spector, a wonderful artist, uh, Buzz and I, and I think four other artists were supposed to be in a show at the Corcoran. And we all pulled out and said, we're not, we're not going to show at the Corcoran. Um, and on the heels of that, uh, Orca Hall uh, resigned. And the, uh, it, was, it was sort of a big to-do. Uh, Dennis Berry was the director of the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati at the time. I'm just thinking, looking at this picture, you could see Carl Salway's influence on the CAC. Uh, that's a, 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 a Nam June Pike sculpture in front of the museum and Lo Yoko Ono's name in the window. Um, he decided he would hold the show. And so he installed uh, the perfect moment at the CAC and the sheriff came in and arrested Dennis uh, and charged the museum and Dennis, uh, Dennis with pandering pornography. Uh, and there was a trial that went on for quite some time. Um, and eventually Dennis and the museum uh, were found uh, not guilty. In the course of this though, the museum 
really had financial troubles. They, um, they lost all of their corporate funding in uh, Cincinnati, which was notably uh, Procter & Gamble was a huge funder. Um, and they, uh, they had enormous legal expenses and they were really in trouble. So one of the things they did, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, I was in any sense their savior, but they asked me if I would have a show with some local corporation. Um, uh, the reason they came to me is in, in the years before that, I had done a show with uh, materials from the scrapyard at Boeing and another one with the scrapyards at Grumman Aerospace. Uh, in each case, I had just gone through the scrapyards and uh, gotten things that appealed to me and these ended up in exhibitions. Um, I had also done a show with R.J. Reynolds for an organization in Winston-Salem called the Southeast Center for Contemporary Art. I made lots of little sculptures out of uh, cigarettes and tobacco leaves and things like that. And I also made humidors. I had recently quit smoking. So RJ Reynolds gave me back all the cigarettes I had smoked in each of the 30 years I had been a smoker. Um, and so I made all these humidors. And so, uh, the, the CAC thought that maybe I would like to work with some local corporation. So I came and I visited uh, the Baldwin Piano Factory, which was spectacular. Uh, and the company that ran the uh, barge traffic on the Ohio River. And then I came to the Verdon Bell Company, uh, the oldest bell company in the country. They started uh, before the Civil War uh, and the largest bell company. And they make bells in uh, bell towers and carillons all around the country. Spectacular people. So I worked with them to make a show for the CAC that it had four sculptures in it. Uh, this bell, the, the sculpture with the wheels and everything stands about eight feet tall. And then it has 50 handbells, which is four octaves attached to it that all have ringers that ring these bells. I made uh, an octave of nuns with carillon bells in their chest cavities with big ringers on the bells. A jail cell that sections of the uh, jail cell had the bars removed and replaced with hanging bar chimes. Uh, two octaves of bar chimes. And this, uh, Verdon also makes uh, church steeples. And I put two ch church steeples back to back and I'm just gonna cheat by flipping this slide. But that's what they would do. Every 15 minutes, it would reorient uh, and it would ring the Westminster chimes, you know, bung, 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 bung bong, 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 bong. And then uh, in the jail cell on the, on the bed, there were some machines that held a program written by Brad Fidel, uh, who is a uh, composer, an old friend of my wife. Uh, uh, he wrote the score to the, uh, the Terminator movies and all sorts of other things. And he wrote a beautiful score for all the bells in this show. Um, and so the show was at the uh, CAC. Uh, it then traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and also traveled uh, to PS1 in uh, New York. Uh, this is Jim Verdon, who was the president of the company. He passed away uh, a couple of years ago. One day we were sitting uh, at Verdon looking out the window and you could see lots of church steeples. And he said, 
You know, after World War II, we arranged for them to ring all the church steeples around Cincinnati. Maybe we could do this here. And there was an opening ceremony at Fountain Square in Cincinnati. This picture isn't from that. I don't have any images. Uh, but there was a handbell choir. And then the MC said, and now churches in the north side, you know, start ringing your bells. And then on the east side and so forth. And pretty soon church bells all over Cincinnati were ringing. Spectacular. Uh, Verdon also makes clocks. And I went back to Verdon uh, some years ago. Uh, they make town clocks like this one in Sag Harbor where I used to live. Uh, and I got a bunch of them for a project in El Monte, California. And we made this. Uh, there's uh, LA Metro, which is the, uh, the public transit in uh, LA has stations as far as El Monte, which is out in the center, out in the valley. Uh, and it is the largest uh, bus station west of the Mississippi. And I took three of their clocks and put them together uh, with cables in this configuration. Around the same time, uh, I was working with flags. Uh, there were um, some Congress people who were calling for a flag burning amendment that uh, desecration of the flag uh, should be a, a constitutional crime. And I thought this was a very un-American idea. So I started making art out of flags. Uh, and around that time, uh, the Fabric Workshop, a wonderful institution in Philadelphia, asked me if I would do something. And I said, sure, let's do some flags. And they have wonderful facilities. They can do anything with cloth. And uh, we started working with flags, making flags, uh, making things out of flags. Um, Eventually, we made stuff that made uh, exhibitions uh, in four different places, including uh, at the Corcoran Gallery of Art. Uh, Terry Sultan, who was the new director there, asked Buzz Spector and I, uh, the two people who had instigated the artists quitting the shows there, uh, to have a two-person show called Transgressions. Uh, and so I showed a bunch of these flag things at the Corcoran. Um, what I knew about the Corcoran was this piece by uh, Ronald Bladen, uh, 1967. He made a piece called The Big X. Uh, so I made a piece there called, uh, oh, his, his piece was called The Black X. I called this Black by Popular Demand. And they were uh, two silk flags that were over dyed in black. So they were dark and sort of smoky and very atmospheric. Uh, this flag was made for the, uh, the big atrium space at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Uh, there's, this was made as part of an exhibition at Arcadia College, which at that time was called Beaver College uh, out in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. That piece, by the way, was made from polyester flags, which is all that I could get the quantity I needed. And I didn't really like how uh, sort of shiny it was. So after the show came down, uh, the people at CW Post College let me put it on their campus where it was weathering and turning really nice. It was supposed to be in a show at the Whitney. Uh, a congressman named Peter King had a demonstration there where he 
he thought that this was a desecration and he insisted that CW Post remove the piece. Well, they didn't. Uh, and a few days later, someone went out and slashed the piece uh, and uh, just destroyed it. Um, so there you go. Uh, by the way, the piece at the Corcoran, which the Corcoran owns since it was made to fit the space, uh, reinstalled it after 9-11, uh, which I found very moving. During those years, my studio uh, was in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, in a building that had been an old movie theater, then became a plastic injection molding factory after World War II, and then my studio. So over the years, I accumulated huge amounts of stuff. I had 3,000 square feet of shelf space in, this, in the studio. Um, Oh, I know why I put this there. This has, I don't have many pictures of the studio here because all I have is what's on my computer. I don't have any of my old slides, uh, but this was a picture of the studio. We had a son, our son Jackson was born and we decided to try living outside of New York City for a while. So that meant giving up my studio so I took all the stuff that I had not used to make sculpture, three truckloads of it, and put it in the lobby of the Brooklyn Museum uh, in an installation that I called Pieces of String Too Short to Save. And then when that show came down, what to do with all that stuff? Carl Salway. <laughs> Carl had bought this building, which is now where uh, the Carl Salway uh, gallery is. He bought it basically as a warehouse to work on pieces by Nam June Pike. Uh, and I took all this stuff and trucked it there. And over the years, we eventually put it into uh, these um, uh, cages made of steel mesh and exhibited those as pieces of string too short to save. Uh, and it's now in the permanent collection of the art museum down at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. So that is what I can tell you about my relationship with Cincinnati, which is pretty deep and wonderful. Uh, in, in the years uh, since I've made lots of public art, now, why do I have this here? Uh, it was misplaced. Um, and I, I can't show you all of it, but I'm going to tell you little stories about a few of the pieces. Uh, Grand Central Terminal, they refurnished, refurbished uh, it and made this new entrance that goes through the Grand Central Market. Uh, so this is, those of you who know New York, this is Lexington Avenue and 43rd Street. And I made a chandelier in the form of an upside down olive tree hanging uh, with thousands of crystal chandeliers, Swarovski chandeliers. Uh, to do that, I met a woman named Jonquil Lamaster, a, a great fabricator who can make artificial trees. And so she made all sorts of uh, studio work for me too, that was shown in, uh, in different places. Uh, over the years, I made lots of work uh, with books, and I continue to make work with books. Uh, my sister's a librarian. Um, like, I think we all love books. Uh, and 
so something came up, a competition to make something at the San Diego Public Library. They were building this uh, fantastic uh, new building uh, with an architect named uh, Rob Quigley, a really brilliant and adventurous guy. I made this for the auditorium. And it's like a piece I had done at Gallery Lalonde. Their books are just screwed right into the wall and then protected uh, with a little steel mesh. This was the first pub public work I made. Uh, it's called The Yearling. It's a long story that I'm not gonna tell you today, uh, but it was made for, uh, for a uh, public school in New York and they ended up not wanting it because uh, for political reasons. And the Public Art Fund showed it in New York at uh, Doris Friedman Plaza in Central Park. And uh, a wonderful, uh, oh, it was on uh, Law and Order in a sort of a walk by, which was a thrill for me. Uh, uh, a, a woman um, whose name is escaping me at the moment, uh, Nancy Teakin, who was a curator uh, and a benefactor at the Denver Art Museum, bought the piece and gave it to Denver to put outside the Denver Public Library, uh, where it is today. This Donald Lipsky sculpture outside the Denver Public Library shares its name with a Marjorie Tinan Wallen's work. Lynn. That's the yearling? Yes. Um, I couldn't resist sharing that with you. This, by the way, this is my son Jackson. Uh, he grew up thinking that the yearling was his idea. Uh, I finally told him he's, he's 30 now. Uh, I told him when he was 25, he came to me, he said, that wasn't really my idea, was it? I said, no. <laughs> um, this is uh, for the millennium. They changed the name of a street in uh, Kansas City to Avenue of the Arts, and it dead, dead ends into this parking garage. And at the art museum there, they have a, a cast of, uh, of the thinker. So I made, these are all life size, the same size as the actual thinker, um, but uh, made into relief. Uh, and at night, uh, they're lit by neon on the inside. They look like bronze, but they're actually fiberglass. I called it Rodan Rodana Dana. Uh, that's my son hamming it up there. Uh, for I made some pieces out of fish for the Miami airport. Uh, I worked with this guy, Mike Kirkhart, three-time world champion taxidermist. And we made about 500 fish uh, that resolved into uh, 100 sculptures that are on walls all over uh, the, uh, that terminal. This is in Scottsdale. Uh, it's three doors put together like a big Richard Serra piece. Uh, they just sit on these little points. Um, they're modeled after the doors at the cathedral in uh, Lima, Peru. And these uh, fittings are all uh, forged stainless steel. So you can enter into it and I lined the inside of it with, with polished stainless steel. So when you walk into it, it's uh, like going into a big kaleidoscope. And up at the top, this triangle you see in the middle is open to the sky and all the rest is reflection. So it makes this sort of virtual geodesic sphere that floats at the top. Uh, a few years ago, Virginia Beach was uh, making a new bridge into town. Um, 
And I had made this piece with a canoe. I cut a bunch of holes in, hung it on the wall and uh, filled it with newspapers. And I liked the idea of cutting holes in a canoe, uh, but making it a little bit more elaborate. So that's what I did. I made this sort of uh, pinwheel of, uh, of canoes. And, and no, it doesn't spin. Uh, it is built to withstand a hurricane. And they've now, since it went up, they've had 90 mile an hour winds there, for which I thank my uh, engineer, Nick Gertz, who is uh, just a genius, lives down in North Carolina. They're lit at night with uh, LEDs that run under the gunnels of the canoes. This is um, the new uh, Terminal 3 at Sag Harbor uh, Airport in, um, in Phoenix. Did I say Sag Harbor? I meant Sky Harbor, of course. Uh, I got some sign painters uh, to uh, stretch some, some canvas and make a uh, oil on canvas mural uh, in the style of Magritte. I wanted a sky like Magritte. And like he would hang a rock in front of his sky, I wanted to hang these spoons. The committee loved this. And this is what was chosen. And then the, uh, they, they were going to, in the middle, have uh, a phoenix like the city. The CEO of the airport said, spoons, uh, I don't think so. We're, you have to do something else. So it transmuted into a pair of uh, aviator sunglasses that, look at that hinge. That's an actual functional hinge. We made these giant sunglasses. Uh, the lenses are made of fiberglass that are then uh, chrome plated. And it's hanging up there. And they, uh, as this was being built, uh, John McCain died and they decided to name the terminal the John McCain Terminal. So the fact that you know he was an aviator and these sunglasses ended up there is total coincidence. Uh, this was at the opening, and of, of course, um, I can't think of her name. Cindy, Cindy showed up. Uh, this this was at a new bus terminal in Reno, Nevada. Uh, I took a bus a 68 GMC uh, bus and cut it up and put it back together so that it now tapers towards the end. When I was uh, scrolling through the, uh, whatever this is called, this header at the front of the bus, that lists all the stops that the different routes that the bus ran. Uh, it had the name Jackson, my son's name. So that became the name of the piece. Uh, the Auraria campus in Denver is a campus, a combined campus of three different uh, colleges, including the University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, they built a new science building. I made a butterfly. Uh, with the cells are made of test tubes filled with resin. So this hits, you know, not just the biological sciences, but, uh, but chemistry too. Uh, they're building the new Pinnacle Bank Arena in Lincoln, Nebraska on a site that had been the Russell Stover Candy Factory and a, a giant presence in Lincoln. Uh, so I made giant chocolates. This guy, by the way, with the feather duster uh, is John Grant. When I made, uh, when Denver bought the yearling, he was running the public art program for the city of Denver. And in the years since, he became my project manager. 
uh, and he's not exclusive. You artists out there who are on working on big projects and getting over your head and don't know quite what to do, talk to John Grant. I could not uh, survive and function uh, without him. He's, he knows everything there is to know about everything. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, making a piece for El Paso, Texas at this unusual roundabout. You see it's sunken down into the ground uh, because it acts as a pedestrian underpass uh, to get from a par parking lot to the University of Texas, El Paso. Uh, and I made uh, this sculpture, it's a big cloud. Uh, and you can, there you get an idea of how it sits into uh, this underpass. And it's made of uh, stainless steel panels that are um, all, hung, all hung separately so that they blow in the breeze uh, and the cloud is constantly moving. Um, let's go. There it is at night. You get the idea. Um, Boston Commons, this is the oldest public park in the United States. Uh, this gold dome is uh, a Goldfinch's uh, state capitol building. And uh, there across the park is St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, the Episcopal Cathedral for, uh, for Massachusetts. And when they built it, to, you have to excuse this, I don't know why this is happening. When they built this 200 years ago, they ran out of money before they could make the carvings that they had intended in the uh, pediment of the cathedral. Uh, so I made this, it's a slice through uh, a chambered Nautilus shell. Uh, I wanted to make something that was uh, spiritual, but without being religious, uh, because this is an unusual church. They have a Muslim congregation that meets there. They have a Chinese Episcopal congregation, a homeless congregation. They're really uh, a church for everybody. And I wanted to reflect that. Goodyear Ballpark, Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, this is where the team called the Cleveland Indians at the time uh, were playing. And what I, uh, what I proposed, and uh, by the way, uh, Cincinnati does their spring training there as well now. Uh, I proposed a feather made out of baseball bats. Everybody loved this. Uh, so this was chosen um, in a competition. And uh, the only people who really didn't love it were the Native Americans who hate the Cleveland Indians with good reason. Uh, Cleveland had always had this uh, rather gross caricature of an Indian as their, um, uh, their logo. Uh, so I went and I talked to uh, some uh, American, uh, Native American artists that I was put in touch with by the Heard Museum of American Indian Art, I believe it's called in Phoenix. Uh, they told me how the feather is a sacred symbol for Native Americans and they're never allowed to touch the ground. So I said, well, how about if I take the feather and put it up on a pedestal so it's not touching the ground? They loved this. They thought that that was just fine. Uh, but the, uh, the team, they had had enough. They wanted me to come up with a brand new idea. Oh, by the way, I had suggested along the way that they change their logo from this to this. Why not a feather? Uh, of course, now 
uh, they've changed their name to the uh, Guardians and their uh, insignia is just simply a Red Sea. So this, in, doing, in putting it on the pedestal, it got me to thinking about Brancusi. Uh, for Brancusi, the pedestal was uh, of almost equal importance to the sculpture he would place on top of it. So I thought about the bird in space. Uh, and I decided to make a bird in space, the same length, the same height as the distance from the pitcher's mound to home plate, 60 feet, six inches, and put seams in it like a baseball. And that's what we did. The, uh, the landscape architect uh, suggested putting it in uh, a pond and uh, we did that as well. So there it is. I called it the Ziz after a, a, a Jewish mythical bird. Um, and it's become a, a real a landmark and a symbol uh, for Goodyear. Uh, by the way, they, uh, this is their mascot, which they call Zizzy, uh, which must be the goofiest mascot in baseball. Uh, NYU Hospital in my hometown, like about five blocks from where I live, uh, was building a new children's hospital right along uh, the, the East River. And they needed a sculpture to go right there. So thinking about taxis, which is how all the kids are going to uh, come to the hospital or the vast majority, I proposed this, uh, sort of a, a toy dog holding a taxi as if it was its toy. Uh, I love the irony of this toy thinking a real taxi was his toy. Uh, everybody loved this uh, and this is what we were going to do. Um, but then this woman, uh, Dr. Mano, who is uh, the head of pediatrics at the hospital came to me and said, you know, instead of just thinking about the kids, why not think about the thousand or so medical professionals and uh, other people who work in the building uh, and try to make something that's a little bit more dignified, a little less childish. And that led me to rethink the idea uh, and uh, make this. Uh, which is, I think, a dog that has the attributes you would want in uh, your doctor, uh, patience and uh, concentration and, and playfulness. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, because you're all sculptors there, I thought I would show how this is done. There's of course a steel structure inside the dog and it resolves in this uh, steel tube that sticks up out of the dog's nose. And then the taxi, which of course has no engine or transmission, but it's a real taxi. It's a, uh, it's a uh, Prius that was given to us by uh, Toyota uh, and it has this other tube inside that's actually two halves that bolt together. And you can see right under the license plate, that other tube slides into this and gets sucked up. So it's become a, a real selfie spot. Um, this is, uh, I, I forget the guy's name. This is the uh, policeman, the canine patrol guy who patrols that area. And this is not a Photoshop. He taught his dog uh, to do this. 
and that's me standing in front of the sculpture. Uh, by the way, Spot got her own mask uh, for uh, the pandemic, uh, which has been really appreciated during this time. Uh, the Riverwalk in San Antonio, fantastic WPA era uh, attraction, just a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, a few years ago, they decided to extend it up another mile and a half, and I proposed a school of goldfish underneath where it passes under I-35, which they were afraid was going to just be a dark, spooky place that people wouldn't want to go any further. Well, at a public meeting, somebody suggested to me that there's this wonderful fish called the long-eared sunfish that grows in the river uh, that only grows to about six inches. And so the goldfish became long-eared sunfish and we put up a school of them, uh, again, made by Mike Kirkhart. Uh, in fact, just uh, last week, I don't have pictures, but I just installed the third sculpture uh, that I used him as a fabricator. So they light up at night. Uh, there are, uh, there's a school of, if school is the right word, of bats, a colony of bats that live under the highway. And every night crowds go out there, all the bats fly out, then the fish light up, uh, and then everybody applauds and heads for the cantina. Penn Treaty Park in Philadelphia. This is where uh, William Penn signed the lasting treaty uh, with the Native Americans there, the Lenape tribe. Uh, if you're going to the park, first you have to walk under I-95. Uh, so I put two street lights on either side. Uh, one has a wolf perched on top for the wolf clan of the Lenape tribe. The other has a turkey for the turkey clan. And the third clan of the Lenape are the turtles. And after you walk under the highway, there are a series of turtles marching down uh, towards the river, each with a lamp perched on its back. These were made for me. Do I have a picture here? Yes, they were made for me by uh, Chris Collins, who is a realist sculptor who became a friend of mine in Pennsylvania. And I wouldn't know how to begin sculpting a wolf or a turkey. Uh, he, he sculpted those for me. His brother, John sculpted the turtle. Uh, and he's now worked for me on four or five uh, different projects. I'm going to show you something in depth now uh, that's one of my most recent projects. Uh, the Philadelphia Police Department is creating a new headquarters in the building that had been the building of the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. Uh, it's an Art Deco landmark on Broad Street, right in the middle of town, a few blocks north of City Hall. My thought was to make a giant badge. They wanted something for the lobby, a giant badge uh, that was studded with more than a thousand actual police badges. Uh, some years before, for the Central Park Conservancy in New York, uh, they were having a fundraising auction and I made this bench for them uh, covered with New York City subway tokens. And this idea, uh, which I love, stayed in my mind and really led to the idea of studying this with actual police badges of all the different ranks. Um, so this was my plan. Uh, the center of every badge is the seal of the city of Philadelphia. 
and it's it's there on every badge of every rank. And so for a seal, I decided to appropriate this wonderful uh, seal that was made uh, by a man named Dexter Jones, a Philadelphia sculptor uh, who made several public art pieces around town. Uh, and it's just beautiful and has to me that same sort of art deco feel that would be right at home in, uh, in the new police headquarters building. So this was the plan uh, to hang in the, uh, in the lobby and to be right double-sided. So in the window, through the window from Broad Street, you would also see it. Uh, and it would be very visible and become a symbol of uh, the building. Well, then a year ago, May, uh, George Floyd was murdered and I was left uh, really totally flustered. I didn't know what to do. Uh, the city erupted. There were peaceful demonstrations all over Philadelphia, giant, you know, in the many tens of thousands of people, uh, as there were all over the country. Uh, however, there was some looting, uh, some police cars were set on fire. Uh, in, in front of the uh, Dexter Jones uh, uh, sculpture at the Municipal Services Building, was a statue of Frank Rizzo, who had been police commissioner and mayor of New York in the uh, uh, in the seventies and eighties. I think I might have that wrong, but I think that's right. He was a real racist son of a bitch, uh, and there's no two ways about it. Um, his idea of police leadership was breaking heads and being the tough guy. So this became a center of protest. Uh, and eventually uh, the mayor took that sculpture down. Um, so I didn't know what to do. Should I just like pull out of this project? Should I have nothing to do with this police department that the more I looked into it, it had a racist history going back to before the Civil War. However, I decided to try to do what I could. The police badge uh, is a show of public trust. Uh, it represents honor, integrity, truth, and justice. And it's a symbol of service to the community. The seal of the city, I'm having a little trouble talking because that leaf blower, I don't know if you hear it, but it's just like roaring in my ears. So hope we get through this. this the seal of the city is presented all different ways and has been uh, in the 200 years, it's been uh, the symbol of the city. So I thought that maybe by playing with the symbolism in the seal, I could make something that would be not a, a, not a, I had originally thought of this, the shield, the badge as a shield, a symbol of protection. But for the African-American community, it's really a symbol of oppression and fear. Uh, and I wondered if there was a way that I could change it into something that would really uh, be inclusive and seem to be a symbol for everybody. The seal is flanked by these two goddesses. On the left is the goddess of peace. And I decided instead of this abstract 
Greek goddess, I would make it an actual person. And I chose Lucretia Mott, who was an extraordinary woman. She was an, an abolitionist. Uh, she was invited to an abolitionist. Uh, she was a Philadelphia's candidate to an abolitionist conference in London. And she went there uh, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And the two of them were not allowed to speak because there were women. So they came back, they, uh, they uh, put together this thing called the uh, Seneca Falls Convention, uh, the Women's Rights Convention in, uh, I think it was 1848. Uh, and the two of them together penned the Declaration of Sentiments, which says, uh, that uh, all men and women are created equal. Pretty straightforward, but it took that long. She was also one of the founders of Swarthmore. She was one of the outstanding American women uh, of the 19th century. So peace holds traditionally a street plan that William Penn made for the city of Philadelphia. The reason peace is holding that is Penn determined to have a peaceful relationship with the Native Americans, made a street plan without any battlements, without any fortifications. I've now taken that, uh, that scroll and it now says, a quote by Martin Luther King, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. Uh, that same quote is on the wall uh, as one of several quotes at the Martin Luther King Memorial on the National Mall. For uh, plenty, I gave it the likeness of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, an abolitionist, a suffragist, uh, a little bit younger uh, than Lucretia Mott, maybe about 10, 15 years younger. Uh, she was a teacher, a poet, uh, a speaker, uh, a bit of a rabble rouser, an extraordinary woman. She was a um, uh, hundred years before Rosa Parks. She refused to give up her seat uh, to a man on a segregated trolley in Philadelphia. Uh, a poem of hers is excerpted at the, uh, the contemplative court of the new National uh, Museum of uh, National African American History Museum in Washington. Uh, in part, it says, all that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. So plenty traditionally holds a cornucopia. She still does, but instead of being full of fruit, it now has emblems of the things that people in need, so desperately need housing, uh, medical care, education. The uh, badges, the uh, 1400 actual badges, I've given them all the number 2020. Uh, it's of course the year the sculpture was created. Uh, and of course, a historic year that we're all going to remember and our children will remember. Uh, but it's also the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, when women won the right to vote. And it's the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, when Black men were given the right to vote. So after I had made these changes, we hadn't built anything yet. It's all in my mind. Uh, I, I presented it uh, individually to all of the original panel members. Uh, including some rank and file policemen. Uh, and then I did a Zoom call like this uh, with 
the police commissioner, Danielle Outlaw, interesting name for a police commissioner, whoops. Um, she had just started her job uh, January before COVID hit. And she by and large really liked uh, what I was doing. But there was one story she told me, not making any re recommendations, just telling me the story. At the bottom of the badge, uh, at the bottom of the seal is the city's slogan, Philadelphia Manetto, uh, which means let brotherly love endure. I changed it to, from the, to, into English to make it more inclusive. When she came to Philadelphia, she was told, welcome to the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. Well, this didn't go over too well with her. Uh, and I changed it. I thought that it was okay. I was certainly aware of it, it being sexually uh, biased, but I thought that with these two female figures so dominant in the piece, that it was okay. But after talking to her, I changed it to Let Love Endure, uh, which became the title of the piece. Uh, so once again, I turned to Chris Collins, uh, who sculpted this. Uh, he did it all in clay. Uh, and then eventually we made the badge out of fiberglass uh, and it got finished with a beautiful uh, metallic finish and all the badges attached to it. Um, uh, the badges, by the way, were made by Smith and Warren in White Plains, New York. They're little works of art in themselves. And they're a fabulous company and they make the badges for the Philadelphia police. Uh, and the thing is all finished. Uh, we have installed it in its place in the building. The building is not yet open. Uh, so there's been no uh, public word of it. You're the, you, this is the first public presentation uh, that I've made about the piece at all, other than uh, to the uh, city's uh, arts commission. Um, and so we don't know how it's all going to unfold. It's just basically sitting there um, and we will see how that is all received. If we have time, I don't know how we're doing time-wise, uh, but I think I wanna show you quickly one last piece. Um, there's with, uh, with statues being torn down all across the country. Uh, I was in a competition to do something at the Mineola Long Island train station. And I thought I'm going to try to make a statue of absolutely unassailable figures that will never be torn down. So this is Betsy, Bessie Rach. Uh, she got a medical degree in, from Tufts in 1904. And she was shortly afterwards over in Paris where Orville Wright demonstrated his airplane and she was swept away. She wanted to fly. She married a man, they moved to Mineola, which was a center of flight at the time. Uh, and in their house, they built an airplane modeled on the Wright brothers airplane, uh, but lighter using bamboo, using silk instead of canvas. Uh, and she, she became the first female solo pilot in the United States. Uh, in 1910. This is Roxy the dog, a dog that wandered onto the Long Island Railroad and ended up living on the train for 12 years. Uh, so I thought a statue of Bessie holding up Roxy would be, these are figures nobody's ever gonna find any fault with. She, by the way, flew for a couple years and then uh, 
was through flying, moved to California, and uh, spent the rest of her life as an OBGYN. She had no interest in the limelight, and that's why she's completely unknown. So we are making a 20 foot tall bronze statue of these two figures. And of course, again, I turned to uh, Chris Collins, and this is the life-size foam that he's working on and refining uh, right now. And I, to me, I'm very excited by this. And there is uh, Roxy. So that is uh, the end of my presentation. Um, I guess the thing to do is to stop sharing. There we go. Hello, Donald. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you fine. This is Matt. Hi, um, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we do have some time for questions, if you do. And we never heard the leaf blower. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. It, and, was, uh, it was just like in my ears. So I, I got flustered a few times, but good. I've so got I questions prepare. from the Zoom chat, and but we'll start maybe in the audience. In person audience, anyone has a question? Yes. I am just blown away. You're absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for bringing your work to us. Though um, we've seen some in live, some of us, but that's just incredible. I we've been exposed today to a lot of digital um, assistance in creating large sculptures. Does Chris Collins use the CNC machine to uh, make make these things? Are they digitally uh, produced and executed or how does that work? Uh, here's, here's, how, um, here, here's how it worked with, with the uh, new Mineola sculpture. Chris made a, uh, a, a statue uh, he, out of clay that was, I would say about two feet tall. Uh, he had that scanned, and then uh, a, a machine cut it out of foam and sent it to him. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, scanned it, blew it up to about eight feet tall uh, and cut it out of foam. And then he took that foam and once again, covered it with clay and really refined the details, then had that scanned uh, and blown up to what it will be our actual size. And he's now working that, filling in with clay, making whatever repairs he needs to, carving into the foam uh, at full scale, to getting all the details just right. When he's done with that, an actual physical mold will be made from the from that uh, to do the bronze casting. Um, there was there was a I'm I don't some some things are done visually uh, uh, digitally the uh, the for the police piece the badge I sketched it out. I just drew it flat. Uh, and then I believe a man named Mike Mowry, who is, does some uh, graphics for me. He lives in Denver, uh, where he can work very closely with John Grant. Um, he, uh, he made a graphic representation of giving it some thickness and filling it out and making it not a flat badge, but something with some curve to it. Uh, and I, we were able to uh, take what he did and rotate it in space so I could really see uh, that I liked it. And then from that, some sort of, some, something was sent to somebody and they, and they made the badge. Uh, they, it was sent to a, a company that I work with 
in Sparta, Wisconsin, that's called the Fast Corporation. Uh, they uh, traditionally, they made big uh, bulls to go outside of steakhouses and stuff like that. Uh, they make uh, water, water park uh, features. Um, and so the plot was sent to them and they cut it out of foam and uh, with a machine and then fiberglassed it. And it had little dimples in it uh, that graphically represented where physical holes got drilled to attach each of the badges. Uh, so yes, where, it's, where it makes sense and it's uh, the logical way, uh, we, we use uh, uh, machines of any sort. Uh, most, most of the way I work is I work on the computer. You know, for somebody who's spent his whole life taking things and physically putting them together, I find it equally satisfying to just sit at the computer uh, and, and imagine what I might, might want to make. Uh, where I used to have to have uh, this big inventory of physical things to make stuff out of. Uh, now I just go wandering on the computer and, and find pictures of things that become uh, the basis uh, for my work. Thanks, Donald. Um, yeah. I'm gonna turn, turn the next question over to uh, the Zoom chat, but I also wanna mention that there's a lot of uh, nice words about your portfolio and your presentation there that we'll try to remember to capture for you. Uh, including one from Arthur Soloway, which is great. Glad, oh, glad okay. he's here. I'm glad he joined us. Um, but a question from Rachel Linneman. Uh, wanted to know about uh, whether you work on multiple projects at once or you uh, one at a time. And I think her question came in before you got in very deep into the public work. Oh, okay. Well, before I got into public work, I would have dozens of things going in the studio all at once. Uh, and now, and I would, I would say that I, I still do. I have, uh, I have a project I'm working on in Arlington, Virginia, that was started about five years ago. Um, I, as I mentioned, I just finished uh, this fish piece in Honolulu. The badge piece just went in. Uh, I'm working on a, 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 a piece in uh, Raleigh, a piece in Minneapolis. Uh, I know I'm going to leave people out. I, I have uh, maybe around five or six things going on at a, at a time. Um, and at the same time, I'm, I'm working on competitions. Uh, when I'm fortunate enough to be included as a finalist, that becomes the, the most fun for me because that's just uh, thinking, just ideating, creating, thinking, here's a situation, what would be really great there that I could make for the budget? Um, but yes, I work on lots of things at once and I'm able to do that because I have a great team. Uh, John Grant, is you know after, when he was running the public art program for Denver, he probably worked on 150 projects that he oversaw from the beginning to the end, uh, and also had to do maintenance for uh, and keep up. So he knows what's going to work, what isn't. Uh, the arguments I have with him all the time are. I'll show him something I, I think is a good idea. And he says, you've got to make it smaller. We can't afford that. Um, and so he's always reining me in a little, uh, but he always has great ideas how to, how to do stuff. Uh, I mentioned my engineer, Nick Gertz. Over the years, I've worked with un other engineers and they've all been great. You know, unfortunately, they retire. You know, I've been doing this a long time. Um, uh, other, other, other fabricators. Uh, I'm working with uh, 
with, with fabricators really all over the country, uh, different things come up that require different ideas. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have any idea where am I gonna get some, fabrica some uh, fiberglass chrome plated. So you start looking around and you find good people. So, yeah. Hey Donald, uh, Gary Kulak here. Uh, I just wanted, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you a question. I know that comes up uh, frequently in our conversations, and you kind of opened the door with the word budget. Uh, in your practice of doing all of these public works, it's it's it, a lot of times artists have lost money doing the project itself. Could you shed a little light for the younger people here on how that process works for you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I've never lost money on a public art project, which is great. Um, I have some, I've, I've done projects where I really make a generous amount of money. And I've had other projects where it's pretty close. Um, there's, uh, with experience, uh, and with um, with a with having people like John Grant on the team who have enormous experience, I just get better at figuring out how big I can make something or what I can really try to do. Uh, other other times I get in some trouble. I'll tell you, I made a. Uh, I did a pretty interesting piece uh, in Houston that I had in my talk and I thought my talk was really too long and I took it out. I had, uh, I wonder, I'm not gonna try sh pulling up pictures. Um, I, had, uh, I had designed something for a waterworks plant in Houston that was uh, clawfoot bathtubs that each one was up on a stainless steel stalk. Like it was like a, a bunch of flowers, except the flowers were all bathtubs and each one had its faucets on and they were overflowing one into another making this beautiful fountain all coming down. Well, then 9-11, Homeland Security decided that the water plant wasn't gonna be open to the public. So here we've got money allocated to build this thing and no place to put it. Well, the city of Houston spent about three or four years looking around trying to place, find a place to make a fountain. And it's not easy because a fountain has to be protected and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff. They couldn't find a place. Finally, they said, well, we've, we're redoing Buffalo Bayou Park. Why don't you come down here and maybe you'll have a new idea of something that you could do for the same budget. Great. I went down there. Uh, I had an idea and sort of thinking about a place to put it. And they said, you want to see something great? under the great lawn, they had this great lawn where they're putting a band shell and Buffalo Bayou Park snakes along for, I don't know, for a few miles following the uh, Houston waterway. Uh, and, but there was this one big open lawn. They said, this open lawn is here because it's over uh, an abandoned cistern underground. Uh, that was one and a half times the size of a football field and 25 feet high with uh, hundreds of concrete columns in it. They said, you wanna go down in it? I said, yeah. They took me down into the cistern and I thought, forget what I was thinking of doing. Uh, let's make a periscope to look down into this thing. Great idea. Everybody loved it. We designed something um, and it, it works on video and 
We built a beautiful uh, uh, arbor that contains it. Uh, look on my website and you'll see uh, pictures for it. Uh, DonaldLipsky.net. Um, and we also made, uh, because it all works electronically, we were able to make it so that you could actually run it, operate it from your phone or from your computer. And if, if somebody's there, there's this physical thing and they can use this, uh, this periscope. Uh, but if nobody else is running it at the time, you could take it over with your, uh, with your device. Great, worked like a charm, fantastic thing. Uh, they um, even uh, decided to spend the money to make this, uh, this cistern open to the public and they built a walkway around the uh, edge of it like a mezzanine. Wonderful thing all the way around. Then Hurricane Harvey came and destroyed the works in my, uh, in, in my periscope. Uh, we, we repaired it as best we could. Uh, and then vandals came and destroyed it. It hadn't really been built uh, uh, robust enough. And we are now rebuilding it again. So everything that I thought was sort of a comfortable margin uh, to make a profit on that piece, I don't know about because I'm still spending money and I, I don't know really where it's going to end. Um, so there are times I've gotten in trouble. I don't know if that answered your question, really, about how I deal with budgets. Maybe one more. Who wants it? Oh. Um, so when, when you're now using the computer to design, um, what software are you most comfortable with? The only, the only thing I use is Photoshop. Uh, when I first was doing the, um, the first time I used it, what I did was I hired like a teenager and I sat down behind them for an afternoon and they showed me how to do everything that he knew how to do. And then the next day he sat behind me and I tried to do it. And that was all, that was all I learned. Um, since then I've taught myself more Photoshop uh, because there are tutorials on YouTube and so forth, uh, but that's all I use. I don't have any 3D programs. Uh, if I need something done in 3D, I call my friend Mike Mowry in Denver and he does it. Uh, I don't have um, any uh, graphics programs that hook up to uh, uh, engineering programs or anything like that. I am pretty low tech kind of guy. Um, but I make these pictures and then we build these things and it ends up looking like what I drew on Photoshop. So I really credit that to, to my team. Well, thanks a lot, Donald. Uh, it's been a great uh, closing uh, lecture for the conference and we wish we could uh, take you to the party. I'm but, sorry, I'll be missing the party. <laughs> and thank you for keeping your relationship with Cincinnati and uh, joining us today. I love it. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but thank you all. This was really fun.